and good morning, depending on where you are. Greetings and welcome to the Indiana Association of Blacks for Blacks in Higher Education, as well as the American Association for Blacks in Higher Education webinar. We're really excited that you're here with us. We have two wonderful speakers. And before I introduce our first speaker, just want to let you all know that if you have not joined either IABHE or AABHE yet, it's time to do so. The association is, is created for anyone from the African diaspora, diaspora, Blacks in higher education. And sometimes folks get a little confused. They say, well, maybe this means that I have to be a higher education major, or maybe this is only for professionals or administrators or professors in the field. IABHE and AABHE, we have opened an open door for everyone who, from, from administrators, professors, administrative assistants, staff members, anyone who wants to be part of a collective group of individuals to share our, 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 our common goals, aspirations, challenges, issues, but be in this place that's a counter space and a place that is supportive of you. Again, please make sure that you connect with AABHE and IABHE. And again, welcome to the webinar. Today, our speakers will be Dr. Kara Miller-Herring and Dr. Sharon Fraser-Burgess. Our first speaker will be uh, Karen Kara Miller-Herring. And I'm going to give you a very brief introduction of Ms. Herring. Kara Miller-Herring is the Chief Equity, Inclusion, and Opportunity Officer for the office of the, of, of the governor, Eric J. Holcomb. Eric Holcomb announced her appointment, uh, the appointment of Kara to this cabinet as Indiana's first ever chief equity, inclusion and opportunity officer for the state. In this role, she works with the governor and his team to improve state government operations, as well as remove hurdles in the government workplace and services the state provides. She is a true Hoosier, born and raised, attended Indiana uh, College, uh, K through 12, Indiana colleges and universities. And she, again, like I said, she's, she's a born Hoosier. She's an award-winning scholar, author, pastor, wife, mother of three blessed children. So we welcome Ms. Kara Miller Herring, Esquire. Ms. Miller, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mary. So thrilled to be with you all. Really appreciate the Indiana Association of Blacks in Higher Education for inviting me. Um, we have another dynamic speaker right after me, Dr. Sharon Fraser burgess So I'm going to um, kind of expedite my comments so that we can make sure we have plenty of time for both of our presentations. Uh, when I was contacted about doing this, I was actually really excited to talk with you all because there is a lot going on around higher education, um, academic freedom, DEI legislation that's happening. And so just want to take you through a quick, just a quick glance overview of the landscape of where we are with DEI, not only nationwide, but with our state. So if you can go to the next slide, um, just three things that I really want to cover today. The first, talking about this nationwide attack on diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's a real thing. And there is a heavy focus on higher education and state government and, and with, with the legislation that we're seeing across the nation. Then I wanna to touch on the state of higher education for blacks, not just black professionals, administrators, faculty, but for black students as well. And then finally talk a little bit about mobilizing the movement that we should all be participating in actively and intentionally every day and then optimizing our impact to our state, but also to, to the nation. So if you go to the next slide, really want to give you guys this overview, this map. This is really daunting when you see this map to see where bills have been introduced to eliminate diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher education and in public offices, public spaces, but also where it's been passed into law. Um, and sadly, our own state, Indiana, has passed some legislation Senate Bill 202, and there's been a number of other things that have come across 
our legislators' desks um, that really have emphasized this rhetoric, this ugly rhetoric, to eliminate diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives at colleges and universities across our state, public institutions, and then as well as um, in the spaces that I sit in every day, state government and you know, city government, and looking at how public officials are showing up with this work. It's also interesting to see the states where the bills have been defeated because they have had very active legislators, very active educators, very active advocacy groups who have worked really hard to make sure that this legislation is not moving forward in their states in a very intentional way. And then you see where these things have been introduced that they haven't yet passed. What I will tell you is that some of these states that are light blue, they will turn red. A couple of them may turn purple, but we need to be mindful of where we are um, in the nation right now. If you go to the next slide, I really wanted to highlight this because while this is anti-DEI legislation happening to really attack higher education, um, I too have been a big focus of this work. People are very angry with Governor Holcomb for creating an Office of Equity, Inclusion and Opportunity in the state. And unfortunately, what we just saw with the Republican candidates for governor, all five candidates on stage um, at one of their Republican debates all said that they would eliminate the work that my team was doing once they became governor of the state of Indiana. Of course, they're pandering to a particular subset of the Republican base hoping to get votes. But to have that said, and this was an article from Axios, a national news source, um, to have that said was really sad. Now, the, the interesting thing for me is that um, I'm a Holcomb appointee. I serve on the Holcomb cabinet. So technically, every single person that works on the Holcomb cabinet will be replaced or eliminated at some point in time. That's the nature of politics. And so these are really just unnecessary kind of moot talking points. But it's intentional because they want to show people that the sentiment in this state from the people that are going to be at the highest level, they want you to know that DEI is not top of mind for them. In fact, they want to eliminate it. So that's just an interesting tidbit um, talking about what we're seeing across the nation, but also within our own state. Uh, Curtis Hill, who actually is an African-American gentleman who was running for governor, he actually got up and said, I'm glad to see all of my opponents have jumped on the bandwagon and uh, to, to align with my pledge to eliminate this position, this chief equity inclusion opportunity officer position. Again, they can't eliminate me. I, I'm leaving with the governor. We Our administration's over in December, but they, the, the message they're sending is very clear. If you go to the next slide, I just kind of wanted to give you all a sense of what's going on with our Indiana college going rate. It's not great across demographics. Uh, what you see here is in 2016, that college going rate across demographics was 64%. We've dropped down now to a 53% college going rate and that 53% has held steady. In fact, just last week, they released some new numbers and it's still, it's still at 53%. What you do see, which is positive, is that the 21st century scholars, their numbers are, are continuing to hold steady at a really high rate. But when you go to the next slide and you start to look at this in comparison to the nation, uh, we are actually falling behind the nation with our college going rate. And so thinking about our college readiness reports, everything that Commissioner Lowry is putting out, this is really alarming. The numbers are going in the wrong direction, but not only are they going in the wrong direction, we are tracking at worse pace than the people across the country. So that's something that we need to be top of mind with. But then when you go to the next slide, this is where we really have to pay attention. College equity and access. All races and ethnicities are declining in college going rates. But when it comes to Black students, African-American students, Black students, um, our numbers are the lowest. That number jumped up 2% in the recent report. It's not 43% anymore. I believe it's 45%. But again, that number is so much lower than it was 15 years ago. And so that's alarming, something that we have to be aware of. And so when you think about the first couple of slides I showed where we're attacking diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then we're seeing these numbers where students of color, are, their college rates are declining, there's absolutely a correlation when we're sending a message that our campuses are not going to be one of inclusion, inclusion and equity where we're focused on diversity. Absolutely, that's sending a message. Of course, there's other aspects of that, including the financial costs associated with higher education, but also some of the challenges that we're seeing with early learning, the learning gaps that we're seeing around literacy and STEM for our students of color. Those are also pieces that we have to be mindful, mindful of. So when you go to this next slide, really appreciate you all um, running these slides for me. I wanna talk a little bit about black leadership in higher education before I end with a couple of comments and then we can jump into some questions. But this new report from the American Council on, edu on Education found that college presidency remains older, white, and male. 
The report found that in 2022, 77.2% of college and university presidents were white. Blacks or African Americans were 13.6% of college or university presidents, approximately equal to the percentage of Blacks in the United States population. And Blacks were 14.1% of all women, college or university presidents, and Blacks were 13.3% of all male presidents. Now, what some people might say is, you know, this is actually not that bad. It's tracking with the population of the United States. However, what I want you to think about less so is the fact that it's tracking with the population of the United States versus is this tracking with the percentage of, of kids who are actually moving into these spaces. When you start to think about our colleges and universities and you think about not just university presidents, but you think about those that report up to the presidents, you think about faculty, you think about um, you know, mid-level administrators, are we seeing enough of those faces as well? And that's the, the piece that we have to be really intentional in asking those questions, because while it's great that we're seeing these numbers that are tracking with the population, there are other positions within higher education that are critical to the experiences of our students on college campuses, and we're not there, or we're not being paid what we should be being paid, we're not getting offered opportunities for promotion, or we're dealing with really tough environments where our mental health is at stake, which leads me to our next slide. Um, and this is one that will make folks feel a certain kind of way when you see this, when you think about Dr. Candia Bailey and everything that we saw happening around the loss of this beautiful woman's life, the pressures, the things that she was dealing with, the abuse, the verbal abuse, the mental and emotional abuse that she's endured. I think so many of us, especially Black women who either are currently in higher education or have worked in higher education, this spoke to us in a specific way because we've experienced some of those same things. And so this word cloud that you see here, um, you know, I would I would guesstimate that she was not experiencing these things, right? She was not experiencing a sense of inclusion and support. She wasn't being given opportunities that would help with her professional development. There was no investment into her. When you start to hear about some of the things that were being said and you see some of the emails, there was not a culture of psychological safety for her. And what we're seeing across the nation is that other Black women and people of color, not just Black, but Latina individuals are coming forward and saying, that experience is not unique to Dr. Candia Bailey. That experience is something that I too have experienced. I'm tired, I'm worn out, I need support, or I'm not going to be able to stay in these spaces. And so when we think about those words, I want you to really think about what those words mean, care, grace, psychological safety. If we're not experiencing those things, this next slide is going to be even more important. And this next slide is my last and final slide. I want us to think about mobilizing our movement. I want us to think about optimizing our impact and I want us to be very intentional about it. When I say remain in position, I want to be very clear that this does not necessarily mean that we need to remain in positions that we're in or remain in the same institutions that we're in. When I'm saying remain in position, what I'm saying is remain in a posture of advocacy, a posture of a willingness to move forward in spite of the opposition that we're seeing. Even if we decide that we have to move to a different institution or we may have to move outside of our institutions and move into consulting positions, we have to remain in position to fight because what we're seeing right now is not going to back down anytime soon. When George Floyd was murdered in 2020, it opened the floodgates for the social justice movement where people were really paying attention to equity, to justice, to how it felt to be Black in America. And that rubbed some people the wrong way. They got really upset about that. And they started at that point, the coalition of trying to reverse everything that we saw happen after 2020. And so I'll be honest with you, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be really difficult. We'll see more legislation. We'll see more people, more governors getting up and saying that they don't want anything to do with this type of work. We have to remain in position and be ready. In conjunction with that, we have to be overly prepared. We all know that we have to come into our positions with all of the degrees and all of the accolades and all of the certifications, we have to be darn near perfect for them to even give us the opportunity. But then when we get into the position, we have to be so overly prepared because they're waiting for an opportunity to see that we've slipped up, that we haven't done what we're supposed to do. And so in this next season, I'm challenging us to make sure that we know the data. We know we have the metrics on hand. We are able to talk about the needs of our students in a different way, not just saying this is the right thing to do, but the impact to our students based on metrics and data data analytics, predictive analytics, being prepared to have those conversations in a different way. And then third, and most of all, we gotta be ready to pivot in this season. What we're seeing because of this attack on DEI, our DEI offices may no longer be called DEI offices. They, be, they may be called offices of culture. They may be called offices of innovation and global impact. Who knows the type of terminology, but when this comes to you, when you are in this type of work, when you see that they're changing the language, just be ready to pivot. 
doesn't matter what they call it, but we have to understand that there has to be an inside job. If they call it something different, if they adjust our positions, yes, we should fight back on those things, but at the same time, we have to be ready to pivot so that we can continue to effectuate change in the spaces that we're in. And then finally, the final P, having that courage to push right now, it is exhausting. I'm tired, I'm worn out. I've been in this space for the last almost you know, four years. It'll be four years at the end of this year with the governor. It is exhausting to go into these spaces and constantly have to wordsmith all of those things, but we have to continue to push. We have to have the courage to show up every day in position, prepared, ready to pivot and ready to push so that we can come against those powers that are trying to make higher education an unsafe space for us. This is our space. It belongs to us. We can have an impact. Our students need it. We need it. And so we have to be ready to be, be in position, be prepared, be ready to pivot and be ready to push. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. I hope that you all will send these slides out if anybody wants this content, but I want to stop there so we can take at least three or four questions before we pivot to our next speaker. Thank you so much, Dr. Mary, for letting me share that. Thank you so much for your insightful comments, uh, uh, Ms. Um, uh, Miller Herring. Let's see, um, I don't see any questions in the chat. However, that doesn't mean that there aren't questions out there. Some folks are probably still processing all, those, all the amazing data that you provided us. You know, I, I, I agree with you. Pivoting is what we've done since we, I think we landed here on these shores. So that we, we're gonna have to be able to do. I, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that your team will be moving on with the Holcomb administration. Um, that's, that's, it's, it's a bit um, agonizing and uncomfortable for me to hear. And I'm sure it's the same for, for my colleagues. How can we, how can we start getting the word out that we want to retain if if we if we have you know um, a, a a Republican uh, in back in the um, back in the, the governor's seat again how can we start moving forward making sure that our that our representatives and that the governor knows that we don't want this space and place to disappear. So I'm going to tell you, there's a group who has done this advocacy work really well in our state. In fact, the governor and I just met with them two weeks ago. The Asian American Alliance has been incredible. Rupal Thanawala, who heads that for the state of Indiana, they have been very intentional about requesting meetings with the governor at every turn. Sometimes the governor has said no, but sometimes the governor has said yes. And they've gone in with their agenda and said, this is what we want to see. And the administration has paid attention to that. As Blacks in higher education and corporate spaces, we are going to have to come across lines of difference because we're not a monolith. We all have our own differences. We are going to have to come across lines of difference and figure out who are those leaders that we can send into that state house to say, listen, this work is important to us. I get it, you guys have this legislation, but we're not going anywhere. In fact, the demographics are trending in our favor, right? And so you all need to be mindful that we're here, we have a voice and you have to request those meetings. And when you don't get them, keep pushing for them, writing letters. There has to be that, that effort to get in front of the people that matter. Some of these legislators are never going to change their minds, but the governor's here for all people, not just the R's, not just the D's, not just the I's. And so you have to hold that person in their administration accountable. And I think there is there's a healthy group of intellectual, service-minded folks in the state who can do that. And so I would encourage you all as the IABHE, as the leaders of this, think about who, who is it that we need to send in to those meetings to request that, for sure. For sure, thank you so much. And we're starting to get a couple of questions. Is there a website available where we can, where we can gather more of the information that you've provided in your slides? Yes, I'll actually drop it in the chat. Um, I um, the, the the college uh, so the college readiness report from CHE, the Commission for Higher Education. I can drop that link in your chat so that you can go straight to that and pull that, and then I'll drop the article from the American Council on Education in the chat as well, so that you guys have access to that for sure. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Another, another question regarding uh, the renaming of our offices. Uh, that's that's a bit disconcerting, but like you said. Um, you know, rename, rename as you wish. Uh, we, they changed our names when we came over here and landed on these shores and we still are who we are. So renaming, do, do you have, is there a recommendation? Do you, what, what seems to be the trend? 
So th this is this is what I've been telling people, and I think even if if our governor had been one to create this office now, he probably would have called it something else. So I'll just be very honest with you, because he got a lot of slack for it being called like we thought. He tried to be intentional about not even putting diversity in there because he was trying not to trigger people. Equity triggered them anyway, right? So anyway, they, you just so what I tell people is that if they come to you and you're in this work and they say we have to rename your position. Tell them that's fine, but you need to ask them about the essence of the work. Is the essence of what I'm doing going to change? Is this going to completely pivot the mission? Then, then it's a different conversation. You may have to move into a different space. But some of the names that have not triggered people, uh, offices of culture engagement, offices of global impact, because they're thinking about global diversity. Um, they're really big on this whole intellectual and, and racial and ethnic diversity right now. So they may want to add the element of intellectual diversity into it. Just be open, but always ask those questions. Is, is the mission changing? Is, is the essence of what I'm doing changing? Then we have a problem. If they're trying to take away the very work that's supporting our students and our faculty and staff, that's a different conversation and you may have to pivot out of the organization at that point. Thank you so much. And another question, going back to the earlier slides about the college going rate, you know, uh, have, has there been, have, have you had discussions with the legislators about the, the declining rate and how programs like 21st Century Scholars has helped um, mi minoritized students and underrepresented students be successful in college? I guess there are two parts to this also. Um, I also heard, and a number of us have heard, that 21st century scholars and programs like this may also be disappearing. It's a, it's a bundle of things in this question. So just wondering if you can kind of help us with that. Okay, is that you have a commissioner, Chris Lowry, who we don't agree on everything, but he is a huge advocate for 21st century scholars because he was with the Ivy Tech Institution for so long. He saw the benefits of it. He's going to continue to push for that. Um, the automatic enrollment into FAFSA was huge. They think that's going to help a ton, but there's still some issues with that that I have talked to some of them about, just accessibility, figuring out how to get that stuff done. But what I will say is that um, if we can continue to make sure that the 21st Century Scholars Program exists and that there's always going to be that push from the Commissioner for Higher Education, I think we're in a good spot. Here's the challenge. Um, I wasn't one of those students that qualified for 21st Century Scholars because my parents, they made too much money and so I wasn't able to participate in that. My kids weren't either. I have kids that they were like, I don't wanna go to college. How do we continue to make sure the kids that are not 21st Century Scholars are excited about school. And this is what I will tell you. We have a real big issue in Indiana with K through 12 education. And so our higher education administrators in this state are going to have to even push on that front because it's going to impact us on the back end when it comes to them coming into higher education. Our literacy rates for our black and brown students are not good. Our STEM numbers for our black and brown students are not good. The, and the interest and the grit, what these students are interested in, it's not good, we're losing them at the third or fourth grade level. And so we have to figure that piece out because that's the piece that's gonna really impact that college readiness, college going rate as well. And so I know y'all are higher education professionals, we're focused on higher education, but we somehow have to figure out how to get that coalition, that groundswell support in the early learning and K through 12 space as well. And I'm gonna talk about that. So I'm blue in the face and not even in state government anymore. Dr. Katie Jenner, I know I get on her nerves, but we, we got some issues with the K through 12 space that have to be solved before we can solve some of these other issues. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Yes, it is a it's a P twenty pipeline issue. I do agree with you. And and when you were showing the um, statistics about college presidents, yes. I shudder to think of what type of data you would show when we come to principals and superintendents. Right. Uh, would you happen to have an idea? Are we talking 80, 90 percent white men? I haven't seen it, but I would, I, I, I'm sure I can pull it. And my suspicion, just based on my travels across the state and who I've dealt with personally, is you're looking at that 80 to 90 percent number. We are just not there, especially black men in that K-12 early learning space. And we've got to figure that out. I mean, there, obviously, there's so much systemic racism, oppression, all types of things that go into this. And it's such a big issue. And I'm one that I, I may never, ever run for office, but I'm always going to be in the ears of the people who are in office to help them understand that we've got to solve these systemic issues. And you're right, those numbers are probably tracking very similarly. That's what I thought. And, it, and someone, uh, uh, Rachel Anderson said, more transition programs are needed and collaboration between K-12 and higher ed. 
Uh, it's a struggle. It is definitely a struggle. But I do agree. Uh, a P20 pipeline program of some sort has got to be established because we're you're right. We're still losing these children in that, you know, uh, a school to prison pipeline, and and now to different types of our, our children are medicated and and have have um, issues above and beyond what children have experienced back in my day. So we have a lot. We have a lot of work to do. I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I appreciate this comment from Antoinette um, Branch O'Donnell that said she's been in K through 12 and a multitude of issues impact our Black youth. But she she mentioned one that I've talked to them about, and that's white women are teaching our students. And you have to understand, there are some white women who are culturally competent; they've done the work, they get it. But there are a great majority of them who are not, and they are teaching these kids, some of whom are from the inner city, from urban areas, who they are dealing with hunger, they're dealing with abuse in the home, they're dealing with mental health issues, they're showing up in a different way than we showed up because of social media. And these women, some of them don't understand how to find and see that potential in our kids because it doesn't look like what they're used to. And it's harming, especially our black boys, we're losing them at the second and third grade level because those teachers are not engaging with them appropriately. And we gotta figure that out. Thank you for making that point. Yes, thank you. Uh, let's see, well, it looks like it looks like we're about wrapping up and we're going to transition to our next speaker. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Miller Herring Esquire. <laughs> we, appreciate, we appreciate you being in this space and place with us. We will work diligently to uh, be a voice and be in the ear of the politicians in, uh, in our state capital. Thank you again. And we look forward to seeing you in, in your next journey, in your next iteration, and you're welcome to come to this space at any time for love and support. We appreciate you. Appreciate you. you all have a great day. Thank you so much. Ms. Um, uh, Miller Herring had a, another appointment, and so we had to cut the conversation short. But but that doesn't mean the conversation is not going to keep going, and we've got yet another dynamic speaker with us this afternoon. We have Dr. Sharon Frazier, Frazier Burgess. She is the professor of, the, of social foundations and multicultural education in the, in the Department of Educational Studies at Ball State University and a member of the American Association of University Professors, AAUP. She teaches courses in the undergraduate teacher, licensure, professional education program, and also philosophy and ethics in the Master of Arts and Doctoral Program in Educational Studies. A social activist, a scholar activist, Dr. Fraser Burgess conducts research in the analytic tradition of philosophy of education, where she writes about the ethical, epistemological, and political implications of cultural identity and social positionality. We welcome today Dr. Frazier Burgess. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mary. Uh, it's such a privilege to be with everyone today. Um, and I should say that as of Friday, uh, I am formally uh, Professor of Social Foundations and uh, Multicultural Education at Ball State University, as I have now retired from that position, but not retired from higher education. Uh, to be determined is where I will land. So it is my uh, privilege to talk with you today about um, uh, SB202. And um, so I will get right to it in doing so. So the plan today is to, or just to, for my brief time with you after that amazing uh, presentation from Ms. Kara and just this inspiration uh, is to uh, just give a timeline of the bill, uh, focus on key sections and some provide some su suggestions for uh, taking action. Let's see if I can use that. So the bill itself, its timeline, sorry, I should have let someone run the, the uh, 
PowerPoint. The timeline of the bill, just to, just broadly speaking, is that uh, in February uh, on on the twenty seventh, it passed in the Indiana House. The bill is known as Senate Bill two hundred two, and as you may know, originated out of the Senate Education Committee. Uh, went through the entire legislative process, uh, then was passed. Uh, in the House on the 27th, signed by Governor Holcomb on uh, March 13th, and will be effective as Public Law 113 as of July 1st. So uh, I will focus on some sections, as I mentioned, and uh, really key for SB 202 would be some of the terms that are invoked. So uh, key terms are the institutions to which SB 202 applies, which in this case are all the, the uh, state institutions of higher education as listed. Um, also important is the introduction of a term formally into higher education public policy. And that is the, this concept of intellectual diversity, which has been broadly used uh, and introduced into the rhetoric of politics as really a Trojan horse of a term by uh, particularly David Horowitz, who could introduce this term intellectual diversity to, in a sense, to uh, dilute the power and significance of the motto of the United States, which is e pluribus unum, the idea of out of many, one people. So in a strange kind of cynical uh, response or counter, uh, counter option to cultural diversity, the term intellectual diversity was introduced. And what is important about the distinction between cultural diversity and intellectual diversity is that the notion of cultural diversity is rooted to some of the key concepts in our constitution that recognize cultural background as a component of our humanity, you know, indexed to our, our identity uh, in terms of race, social class and, and, and those other sort of inviolable or innate attributes of what it means to be human. Intellectual diversity is a much more political and, and fluid concept that can be defined fairly arbitrarily. So while it is an ideal to which we aspire, it is a, a much more difficult concept to legislate. So one of the key, another key component of the bill is formalizing DEI oversight by the Board of Trustees. So we know that the Board of Trustees in the past has always had this oversight responsibility. However, typically uh, the oversight of DEI offices and programming is sort of delegated to other subsidiaries within the university. This law makes the Board of Trustees a more direct line of accountability and uh, monitoring for DEI activities. So verbatim from the bill, the Board of Trustees now has the direct responsibility in the work of the DEI uh, office within all of those uh, institutions uh, aforementioned and the work that these offices will do. So there's a very intrusive component that this bill is now really introducing uh, as it pertains to DEI offices insofar as they will exist. Uh, based on Kara's observations, it is likely that this this legislation or this component of it was a precursor to actually doing away with DEI and, and certainly we should be prepared for that to be the case. But for the coming year, beginning uh, July 1, 
there is going to be additional scrutiny brought to bear on the activities of DEI offices. And if Florida is any indication, this step is a precursor to actually defunding um, the activities of diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher education in Indiana. Another aspect of the bill that's really important to, uh, to uh, notice is what's called post-tenure review. And this relates specifically to um, uh, the tenure line faculty. And this review takes place on a five-year cycle. So if you are a tenured faculty member, uh, as of July 1st, on a five-year cycle, your record will be subject to review on the basis of these criteria. They relate to whether you have, as the bill states verbatim, help the institution foster a culture of free inquiry, free expression, and intellectual diversity within the institution, whether you have two introduced students to scholarly works from a variety of political ideological frameworks that may exist within the curricular. And um, this is related specifically to, to that which ex was established by the Board of Trustees. And uh, for number three, while performing teaching duties within the scope of the faculty members' employment, whether you have refrained from subjecting students to views and opinions concerning matters not related to the faculty member's academic discipline or assigned course of instruction. And then number four, whether you have adequately performed academic duties and obligations. Now, number five is a wide open option where you could also be evaluated as a faculty member uh, post-tenure on whether you've met any other criteria that the Board of Trustees has established. Uh, sort of more broadly to uh, non-tenure line and uh, for tenure, uh, pre-tenure faculty member, there, it, there are now these criteria of um, performance review. And this, again, this relates to fostering this culture of free inquiry, free expression and intellectual diversity, whether you are in fact exposing students to scholarly works from a variety of political or ideological frameworks, and whether you are in fact exposing students um, inappropriately to a politicized view that is not re relevant to the, um, the, the discipline or the domain of knowledge on the consideration. This applies to uh, any faculty member of any standing. There's also a complaint feature and this component of the law empowers students and colleagues to submit complaints regarding whether any faculty member has violated any of those criteria in this person's uh, perspective. It provides for no adjudication of these complaints after they are submitted. So the law states that each institution is required to establish a procedure that allows for students and, and employees to submit complaints that a faculty member or person described in, this, in the section of the law referring to uh, faculty members um, is not meeting the criteria uh, that were affirm, aff, aforementioned. This procedure uh, should be provided at student orientations on the institution's website and during employee onboarding programs. So there is this commitment for full dissemination of the right to complaint. Then the institution must refer complaints submitted to 
appropriate human resource professionals and supervisors for consideration in employment reviews and tenure and promotion decisions. Furthermore, these complaints must be submitted to the Board of Trustees or be made available to the Board of Trustees of the institution. You may be wondering, in the bill, does it allow for uh, a due process to vet these complaints? As written, the bill does not. So what can you do? Well, first of all, um, you can report your uh, changes or modifications to your practice um, to a website that in which you can, uh, BSU's AAUP, uh, the AAUP chapter is tracking ways in which this bill, now law, is causing higher educational, uh, higher education professionals to change or shift their practice. There is a sort of emerging dashboard uh, at, with some of the key areas in which you can describe ways in which your professional practice is being altered. Also, um, ACLU, uh, the ACLU has now filed a lawsuit against public law 1113 or SEA 202 in effort to uh, bring about an injunction of the law so that it is not actually implemented and they are seeking plaintiffs because as the lawsuit is structured, it would require faculty members or uh, I do believe it's, it's uh, faculty members of any status to um, really uh, file a lawsuit against their respective board of trustees. So currently the lawsuit is led by two faculty members from Purdue University, Fort Wayne. Steve Carr is one of them. However, ideally they would like to have a representative from every institution that this law covers. And uh, the current structure of the lawsuit, which I, have, I believe I've linked here, uh, takes issue with the violation of free speech and equal protection under the law based on the absence of a due process component to their, uh, to their complaint mechanism. I have listed there the email of Stevie Pactor, who is the lead attorney on this effort. And, you know, we, there's been significant work um, undertaken by the uh, Indiana Association of uh, AA, sorry, the Indiana Conference of AAUP and the, uh, an organization led by Russ Keeper and Pastor Green and Rabbi Spiegel who have, who worked really early on to uh, mobilize against this bill and also approach the Indiana Association, Indiana ACLU uh, to consider taking up this lawsuit. So there has been success in, um, in mobilizing against this bill in that it, the ACLU has agreed to take it on, uh, but obviously representation from every university, each and every institution would be more powerful. And as I understand it, uh, filing the lawsuit in the Southern District of Indiana rather than the Northern District would be, um, would, would, would uh, be a more favorable legal environment. But I also want to encourage you to seek uh, workplace support for what, what um, our, our previous speaker mentioned is the constant onslaught of microaggressions to which black faculty are exposed. And there is an organization that's emerging in Indiana to address workplace abuse and to uh, seek legislation 
that will ensure or guarantee or support psychological safety, safety in the workplace. And you all may have heard of Andrea Moorhead and uh, she was a very well recognized TV anchor in Indiana. And she has been very vocal about being on the, re the receiving end of this kinds of uh, microaggressions. And so it's really important for, you know, first of all, to acknowledge that you may be receiving, you may be on the receiving end of these deleterious experiences and, and to make space and find time to care for yourself and to also learn to some strategies about how to hang in there um, in this very difficult time. So um, I've also included some sources with this presentation that I will make available on a link that, so that you can get access to the information. And uh, just finally, just remain vigilant and know that the race is not to the swift or the strong, but to those who endure to the end. And we cannot forget the words of um, our, of um, Dr. Martin Luther King that the um, that the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And this is a, a phase of the fight that we have to bolster ourselves to um, to to be vigilant. Uh, in staying in the fight. So thank you all for this uh, opportunity to share this information. I've like, spoken like a true philosopher at the end, Dr. Fraser Bur Burgess, I love it. First and foremost, congratulations. Congratulations on your amazing and wonderful decision to move into the next phase of your journey, which is retirement. We know that that I, real scholars don't really ever retire. We know you're going to be in the fight with us. And we just, we're just happy that you're going to be retiring and that will allow you to fight and then refresh and then fight and then refresh and then just keep on moving. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> yes, yes. So we've got, uh, we've got a lot of people saying thank you. Thank you for the amazing presentation. You know, um, one of the things as we began to pull up some questions, uh, one question is, will we will people be able to have access to the slides? Uh, we would love for you to send your slides to our tech person, Mr. Josh Shank, so that he can place those on the AABHE, IABHE website. So a lot I of have, folks are um... Oh, we don't. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you. I, I, don't wanna, I, put, I put a link to a Google form of the slide. I can also send it to Josh in its PowerPoint version because sometimes the Google form is a bit wonky, but that the, all the links are live there if uh, folks want to, to uh, click on them. And it's particularly important for the contact information as well. Great. Thank you so much. This is a daunting endeavor. And as I think about how much time and energy uh, the legislators as well as uh, higher education administrators and board members will be putting into basically silencing our voices, um, I, I'm, I'm just wondering what can, what can we do as, of course, an organization and as uh, Black administrators and faculty on our respective college campuses. You know, the, the process is rolling through. What can we do to get started? You know, the, the pushing back uh, or, or finding the loopholes in this, because I know, there, I, I know that there are loopholes, finding the loopholes in this so that we can survive in this climate. Mm -hmm. No, that is the critical question, Dr. Mary, you know, how, what, what strategies do we have to use? And I think it's important to think back about the civil rights victories that have been won and to know that they were able to make progress by being strategic. And uh, every major shift towards the full realization and of our rights and commensurate citizenship for African Americans came because there was an intentionality about proceeding. There was also 
you know, if you think about how Brown versus Board of Education became law, if you think about how the Civil Rights Bill became law, there was this sensitive awareness of the American cultural landscape. They, there was this understanding of how, how America works and a thinking of two or three or four steps ahead to move the country forward. I think in each one of our campuses, there is no more knowledgeable uh, analyst of the landscape than the black administrator. And it will be important first to, first to have unity. Okay? So there needs to be an effort to coalesce together and to move in tandem strategically. And I think the strategy, a key strategy is attacking the most harmful point of the bill right now, or portion of the bill, which is my, in my estimation is the complaint feature. And uh, so what counterforce can be established on the campus to vet these complaints? And I think there can be a fair amount of, uh, you know, of, of an, an argument to say that there should be a vetting the law does not prohibit a vetting process. So there is that, that opening to assert a right to, um, to, to have some way to adjudicate the, the, the complaints that are being made. And that is the most, I think that would be the most harmful portion and that, that will be the most helpful uh, first step in the strategy. But there's a whole strategic set of uh, conversations that need to happen about the short-term and the long-term plan to address this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fraser Burgess. We have another question with regards to um, NAACP, ACLU. It looks like they've, they have uh, collaborated in other states. Has there been any movement in that direction here in the state of Indiana? Yes, I believe that the NAACP was part of a coalition along with the um, the uh, I think it's the Association for Racial Justice, I believe, head by R Russ Kiba, and also this is a coalition consisting of Russ Kiba, Pastor Green, and Rabbi Spiegel, and uh, so they approached Governor Holcomb at a critical point when it was to be determined whether he would sign the bill. There was a demand to meet with the civil rights leaders. Governor Holcomb chose not to do so. Oh, well, I think in his words, he, I think it was reported as that as a that the, the proper legislative procedure was followed. He, he, not to say he refused to meet with them, but that the proper legislative procedure was followed, whatever that means. So so yes, there's been there's been some coalition work um, ongoing, but after the bill was passed, there was kind of a, you know, as you can understand, as you, as you can imagine, a, there's a significant disappointment and so kind of deciding where to go from there there hasn't been a kind of a regrouping uh, after that point thank you so much for that um, response it looks like we've got to you know there's strength in numbers and it sounds like we need to keep working together so that um, we we come together as a collective voice to to dismantle this like they so strategically have dismantled so many other equity efforts in the state. With regards to, um, uh, you know, faculty and staff getting together on, on our college campuses, well, you know, actually, it seems as though that this bill, it seems as though it's impacting more of, like you said, the intellectual uh, academic side of the house. Does this bill impact very many efforts on the administrative side of, of higher ed? Um, for example, in student affairs, you have African American cultural centers, you have multicultural, cult multicultural centers. How, how will this bill impact 
the administrative side, the student affairs side, mm -hmm. the minoritized students on campus in their extracurricular or extracurricular activities? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a great question. Um, one of the subtleties of this bill is that it has also requested that there be a report of the funding uh, dedicated to DEI activities and a sort of a, a, a comprehensive reporting of the nature of these activities. If precedent is an, an any indicator, this becomes a, a means of understanding the budget line item that uh, of dedicated funds in order to then claim that too much money is being spent in support of these activities directed at minoritized students, especially minority students, especially in light of affirmative action ending of any form. And just the anti-BIPOC um, focus of this this political milieu, if you would. So I anticipate that while there is no direct impact at this point, except beyond the vulnerability to being um, targeted by students who are saying these activities in some way are more political than they need to be, are more di are divisive by their very existence because the complaint feature allows for that argument structure. Uh, it would be that the next step in the, in the upcoming budget session is to say that we're spending far too much money on these programs in if if color blindness is our goal, as they would say, and that would so there's to so just anticipate that this is happening. But here is where I think that um, the Indiana Association of Blacks in Higher Education has to become almost like a political action committee in a way, because the constituency of higher education and blacks in particular has a political voice that way. That it that is a megaphone, and so with at the risk of seeing seeming sort of polit, you know sort of political, there is a governor's race coming up <laughs> here, and we would need to migrate towards the candidate who's most friendly towards you know the interest of the organization, and so seeking a prominent place in. I think, yes, you know, Jennifer McCormick, most certainly, but also it's an opportunity to have a conversation with Mike Braun. Um, it, it is to get him on record, having to grapple with some of these issues in a way that he, may, he has to take a stand. And so I think showing up and making both candidates having to address these issues is an important part, whatever form that takes. Make it becoming a political action committee, but not necessarily saying at the beginning which side we're on politically, but 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 uh, you know bringing media attention to the concerns, priorities, and interests of this organization, and then making them go on record. Um, it, and the last thing I would say, because I can get I can go long, <laughs> and I care deeply about this, as you can see. We are so tempted to fade into the background because it's so hurtful to have to fight this fight that we thought after George Floyd's murder, we thought we saw a glimmer of the promised land, right? For a moment. And to have it snatched from us in four years is almost too much to bear. And so there is a temptation to back away, fade into the distance as we realize these people just don't want us around. But I would say rather than backing away, show up even bolder and bigger and say, we're not just like, you know, Kyra said, we're not going away. We have a moral imperative in this democracy and showing up and saying we, blacks have always been the moral voice of this democracy. And now more than ever, we need to, to use the megaphone of our moral standing to call this nation back to its moral, aspirations that it's failed to live up to, but we, we've always been the ones to call this nation to that. So I'll stop there. What a way to end. That was, <laughs> no, 
you hit the nail on the head, Dr. Fraser Burgess. Everyone's giving you um, applause emojis and and amens and and bravos. Uh, uh, Iris Al Outlaw also stated, going back to something you were you were talking about. You know, this clearly shows overall that the uh, that the individuals who are writing these policies to dismantle DEI clearly don't understand who were the benefactors all along of affirmative action and all of these of all these policies. You have really just scratched the surface for us. It's one o'clock. We're going to need to end this amazing presentation, everybody. Thank you for your advocacy. Again, congratulations on your retirement. I don't know why you're retiring because you look like you're about 35 years old. <laughs> but you know, you know how they you know how that goes for us. But <laughs> you're a blessing. Thank you for Thank being you. in this profession. Thank you for blessing Ball State. Thank you for blessing us today. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, partners. Thank you for being here today. This concludes our webinar. We'll see you again on the next one. Have Thank a blessed so week, everybody. Thank you.